Hi everyone, Matt back with you. Hope you're okay. Today I'm in an area that's called Longfield Road. Behind me is the Unitarian Church. Longfield Road goes up right up to the top of the hill, but at least a century ago, this particular spot was known as Hanging Ditch. And there were houses here next to the Golden Lion and there would have been houses over here this area is known as the cockpit I once lived there and the houses were ones that had kind of a bottom floor and a top floor There are not many photos that exist today of what Hanging Ditch looked like but you can see the cockpit building there still on the right hand side I think all the other buildings are pretty much gone and that's the shot as it looks today In 1863 moving into Hanging Ditch after recently getting married at Heptonstall Church were Thomas and Mary Ann Midgley. Thomas and Mary were roughly in their early 30s when they got married uh, and when they moved to Hanging Ditch Thomas's father actually lived in a house a little bit further up the street. It was only after about a year of marriage that things took a very sinister turn. Early into 1865 Thomas fell ill. He ended up getting some really severe stomach issues to the point uh, he stopped working and would spend his day in the house. His wife though still had to work. Because Thomas was unable to sleep from the pain he decided, or well, his father decided, that it would be best if Thomas moved in with his father, as I say, just a little bit further away, so that Mary could get her rest during the night and then go off to work the next day. She wasn't disturbed by Thomas. And it seemed whilst Thomas was at his father's house, something else was happening up here. Thomas's neighbours would comment that for a few weeks leading up to the 25th of January 1865 his behaviour had become increasingly odd. They spoke about a man who would stand outside the house and seemingly stare into the distance at nothing at all. Erratic behaviour seemed to increase exponentially when Thomas moved back in with his father. Because it was only a one bedroom building, uh, Thomas actually had to sleep with his father. And his father wasn't getting much sleep at all as Thomas would just talk and talk and talk about seemingly nonsense, again, about people of that house who'd passed away and wondering what their spirit was doing, and then scream and shout to the point where his father who was called William had to get his brother Amos to come in and even tie him onto the bed to stop this er these erratic outbursts that were happening. On the 25th of January though Thomas had gone home that morning Mary was there too house below the Midgley's belonged to somebody called Sarah Dawson and early that morning she'd heard what could only be described as strange scratching noises coming from the house above and then there was an almighty scream. Sarah left her house as quick as she could and ran to William Midgley's house, Thomas's father. 
banging on the door to get him out of the house to say, you need to come to the Midgley's house. Something's happening there. Sarah and William both went to the Midgley's house and William was banging on their door and he was about to break it down when Thomas opened the door. What they saw when they entered the house was horrific. Mary, face down on the floor, blood spurting from her neck. Next to her was a blood-stained knife. And Thomas, there, with blood-stained hands. And the first words out of his mouth were, I've done it. I've done it. At that point, Mary was actually still alive, but sadly passed away just ten minutes later. She'd taken four stab wounds to the neck. Doctors claimed that three of them she would probably have survived from, but the fourth one was the damaging blow, which finished her off. Thomas then said, I intended to do it last night, but an angel came and took the razor away. William stayed with his son Thomas while Sarah ran down into Todmorden and found the nearest policeman who came to the house. Whilst he was at the house, he noticed that on the hearth in the fire was a screwed up piece of paper. It hadn't burst into flames, possibly as expected. So he took the piece of paper and started to read it. Whilst doing so, Thomas grabbed the paper from the policeman, shoved it into his mouth in an attempt to eat and swallow it, but the paper was actually then retrieved back from Thomas. What was written on it was basically what Thomas had planned that morning. The letter read as follows. Thomas Midgley and Mary Ann Kershaw. This is my last duty in this world. Before I leave it, I warn the world of the folly of sin. The Almighty has laid his hand upon me and myself because of my sin and wickedness. He has been just and kind to me allowing me to have too good a wife. My sins are most numerous than the hairs on my head, and the consciousness of my own folly has made me crazy. But thou hast been just and kind. But I have been a wicked sinner. There is nothing to look for in this world but misery and woe. The Almighty has laid a curse upon me, and there is my hope, either in this world or in the next. But my wife has been an angel of light, and I am to stand the hard wrath of God in the fire. After being charged with murder at the police station, Thomas was taken to the railway station to be sent off to prison. And at this point in time, obviously a good number of people had heard what had happened. And large crowds gathered as Thomas made his way to the train station, uh, I presume in handcuffs, uh, but with a police presence there. And apparently he was very quiet and just got on the train and was on his way. An inquest was held the next day uh, at the Golden Lion, pub where we started our journey today. At that inquest they spoke to doctors who had uh, seen Thomas over the period of time he'd been ill. The doctors relayed the information back that the only time they'd seen Thomas the complaints had been about his stomach. But during that time he'd showed no signs of any mental problems as such. 
the inquest came to the conclusion that Thomas had willfully murdered his wife, and so a trial was set for Leeds Assizes in April. Before we get to the trial, what happened there, which will be brief, I think we should go and pay our respects to Mary. Okay, so this is the grave of Mary Ann Midgley. Uh, it's a bit of an overgrown section in Crossstone Graveyard, uh, but actually in front of this grave it's fairly clear, so uh, it's pretty worn after all this time. Let's have a quick look at it. So the sun is not helping with filming today. Uh, in memory of the top name, Mary Ann Midgley of Hanging Ditch, who died January 27th, 1865, age 32. Uh, so, yes, there's no mention of what happened on this one. Sometimes graves do say what happens, but uh, no, not this one. And as you can see, uh, the family follow on. Rest in peace, Mary. So the trial did take place in Leeds in April of that year, 1865. And the evidence against Thomas was overwhelming. Both the policeman who found the note, the note itself, the doctors claiming they'd never treated Thomas for anything other than his stomach infection. And even Thomas's father's evidence. Thomas himself just decided to blame his father and the system, saying that they should have taken better care of him and then he wouldn't have committed such an act. The jury went out and soon returned. However, on the charge of murder, that was changed. Instead, Thomas found himself sent to Broadmoor Criminal Lunatic Asylum. So thanks to some, as usual, wonderful research from Holly Burgoyne, what we've managed to find out is that Thomas spent the rest of his life in the Broadmoor Lunatic Asylum for the next 38 years before passing away in 1903 as he appears there on the 1871, 81 and 91 census but where Thomas's final resting place is we don't know so when people talk about the 19th century Tomberden murder it's most likely they'll be talking about the murder at the vicarage uh, but this one, I think, is equally as gruesome, even though it doesn't cover quite as many people. It's just seeing one uh, person lose their life. But in the end, Thomas was locked up for 38 years due to religious mania. And you have to imagine that when they got married on Christmas Day in 1863, that whatever was going on in Thomas's head wasn't being displayed at that time and no neighbours ever suggested that anything had happened in that time that they were quite a happy family so what did happen in his head at the height of his illness when Thomas was staying with his father um, one of the things his father told Thomas to do was to pray to get better uh, so they were obviously a fairly religious uh, family. And maybe that's where the idea that angels were talking to him came from. I think the letter gives a very deep insight into what was going on in Thomas's head. However, what we haven't pointed out is that missing razor that uh, Thomas said the angels came and took. It was actually his father who took it because they shared the same razor and he'd taken it to use. So that's why it wasn't there uh, when Thomas looked for it to commit the uh, act the previous day. 
At the time, the newspaper reporting the story said it was the first time that they had ever had to cover uh, a murder case. And both they and the people of Todman had hoped that it would be the last. But as we've found out, it wasn't. Take care. See you soon.